So today what we're talking about is hardware description languages, um, or HDLs. And these are a totally new way of programming um, typically programmable logic boards. So this stuff won't be on the exam at all. It's not technically part of anything. Um, it's sort of extra. So it's stuff that in work may be extremely useful, and even for your own personal projects. Um, because this is this is how we actually program the boards. We don't, for large projects, use schematic entry. It's just too crazy. So with an HDL, or hardware description language, um, it looks a little like software that you might already be doing. So it looks a bit like you know, C or something like that. The difference is that with software, say we have these statements. Um, we have a computer, and the computer executes stuff. So first it goes A is equal to 5. And then it goes C is equal to A plus 2, so C is equal to 7. And then it goes F is equal to that value of C plus 3. Um, so, you know, F is equal to 10. And that's, you know, just goes through, statement by statement, and that's it. The difference with the hardware is you're actually describing hardware. You're not saying do this, do this, do this, do that. Um, so if you write these statements, you're saying assign the value of A to 5. Um, this statement is saying create an adder and add um, 2 to A and then assign it to C, and that statement saying the same thing, except we add to 3, which seems like the same as software. The difference is all these statements are executed at the exact same time in parallel. Um, so the value of C will initially be something different because that statement will even execute at the same time that A is being assigned to 5. Likewise, F will be executed at the same time that C is being um, added in this previous statement. So the advantage of hardware is that it's you can do a lot more. You can do it all in parallel. So you can create, you know, you can do 20 things in parallel. That's not a problem. So you can create multipliers that are running at the same time as other multipliers and adders um, and all that. Whereas in software, you have to execute this statement, then this statement, then this statement, then this statement. And you can get, you know, you can do stuff like threads where it looks like you're doing stuff in parallel, but you're not really. At the core level of the CPU, it's still executing one statement, then the next, then the next, then the next. Um, with the hardware, you're, you are doing everything at once. Um, and you can use this, these hardware description languages for really advanced things. This board is a commercial development board. Um, to give you an idea, it's, I think, $90 US. And on this board, you can actually design a uh, microprocessor. So you can design a CPU. You can choose what goes in the CPU in terms of adders and multipliers. And on top of that, you can then run software. Um, but you can also just put hardware straight in this. To give you some ideas, um, in my research, I'm doing some stuff using actually this board to brute force um, encryption keys, and it's just running encryption key checks, and it's doing it you know, thousands of times faster than you can on software, um, because in a few clock cycles, it's able to do a whole bunch at once. Basically, in one or two clock cycles, you can do everything, because it's all in parallel. Uh, so that's where these hardware description languages come in. There's a bunch of different ones, um, and I'll just go over some general aspects of them. This class won't teach you everything you ever needed to know about them. It's just a very brief introduction. Um, they almost always use this idea of modularity and modules. So a module, and there's different names given to it, but it's basically just a block. Um, in that block, we'll have inputs and outputs. So it's very much like the subcircuits you've been using in the labs for the schematic. You create a subcircuit that has a specific function. Um, it does that function, and you can connect it up. So when you connect a big design, you know you might have a whole bunch of these different modules all wired together, and you'll have adder modules, you'll have memory modules, um, all sorts of stuff. And in that way, you don't have one massive design, but you create a block, you test it, you know it works, and then you put it into a bigger design. Um, 
there's almost always this idea of wires and nets. So, and by this I mean wires and nets that have names. Um, so when we're doing logic design in class, we'll you know give them A, B, C, and it's in the same sort of idea. You'll give them meaningful names. So you might call this A, B, and you might call this you know is equal. And then elsewhere in your code, you have some other block, and you assign is equal to this input. And then there's an output, and it's you know, whatever that is. So they all, all of them have this idea that you can assign meaningful names to stuff and give uh, values to that. Most of them, or all of them, have continuous assignments. They'll split into two main things. So continuous assignments are where we actually instantiate logic. Um, so for example, in one language we say y is equal to a and b. This output here is equal to the anding of those two variables. Um, and this is just done all the time. So if I said z, you know, if I had a second statement, is equal to a and b, and then x is equal to y and z. How you would physically imagine that existing is it's actually creating another AND gate here, um, connecting them in parallel, and then and it's going to name this one z, and then it's ANDing that to create x. Um, so again, these statements are being executed all at the same time. So at the same time that this is happening, you can see the z is happening. So this AND gate is just being dropped down like that. Um, so they that's the idea of continuous assignment. They have an idea of processes. Um, processes are blocks where we do stuff in sequence. So this gives you a little ability to do statements that are executed one after another. So for example, you may want to do something, you know, where A, you add two to A, and then you, if A is greater than three, you do something. Um, and you want that comparison to happen after you've already added two. So within processes, we have this idea of doing statements sequentially. The main HDLs, hardware description languages you'll come up across is probably VHDL and Verilog. Um, which one to use is almost chance for most people. It's a lot of it's personal preference. Um, tends to be what you've started using. People will stick with. In the industry, Verilog might be a little more popular, but it's a hard. It's hard to claim that. Um, I know they use VHDL here at DAL for most of the courses, so that's what I'm going to be sticking with. They're very similar, so if you know one, you can quickly pick up the other. Um, and the examples, not examples the guy's written, they come from this book, uh, Free Range VHDL, which is freely available, um, Creative Commons license. And there's a link there, so these slides will be online if you want to get the book. And it goes through a ton more examples. If you're interested in this, again, this stuff won't be on the exam. Um, just may be generally useful. So some general VHDL stuff. It's not case sensitive. Um, you can use capitals anywhere you want. So you will see things written differently. For example, some people will always put those ands in capitals. Um, doesn't matter. White space uh, doesn't matter. This oh, all the white space dropped out of here. But what this is saying is that if we, if I had a bunch of extra spaces here, so you know, if I had this second statement look like that, it's all the same. Um, it doesn't matter about those extra spaces. We'll tend to use spaces to make stuff line up, maybe to look nice, but. In terms of actual programming language, what the compiler sees, what the computer sees, it just doesn't care at all. Um, you can add comments, and you'll notice that with dash dash. The editors you can use, and you can use that same Xilinx software for doing this. Um, 
will make comments appear in green so that they sort of blend away a bit from it. Um, and we'll go into that, this little more detail. You have uh, statements a lot like in C. There's if statements, there's case statements, if else statements, um, and there's even loop statements, which I'll talk about later. So in VHDL, you'll have these entities that everything starts with. I talked about the idea of you have a module. You have a module that does something, you test it, you drop it down. Um, an entity defines what this module is. So in this example, we have a, um, an entity here that has some inputs and outputs. So we have a port name, we have an input, we have an output, and we have in out. Uh, in out is bi-directional, so you can receive data or send data, and you do that by making it high impedance, what we talked about before, where we tri-state it. Um, so to give you an idea, here's another entity. So here, if I've created a MUX, um, and I have these three inputs, A, B, C, D, and I want to choose which one of them is picked. And I choose it based on these two variables, so select one and select zero. So this is just like we had before, you know, where we have S1, S0, um, and then there's different inputs, A, B, C, D. This is also introducing something else, which is uh, they have what they call vectors. This vector is just seven wires bundled together. Um, so each of these is actually seven wires, but it doesn't matter when when you pick A, it's just those seven wires are all going to be directed to the output A. Um, so that's the standard logic vector that you'll see around. So here is a typical-ish VHDL um, file. So we can see we have three input ports. So you could draw it as having A, B, C and an output port F. Um, when they say it's standard logic, what this means is that it's just a one bit. And the standard logic type is either one or zero, or it should be one or zero, or Z, Z being high impedance. Um, potentially it can be other values, but we won't worry about those now. Um, and we have that, and then we have this declaration here where we're saying that's the module, and then this is what the module does. So we have this architecture declaration. So the architecture declaration is telling you exactly how everything works. Within that, um, we have some internal variables, so we can either define a signal. A signal is something that um, can be used to connect to the output, essentially. So for example, we have this sig1. So we're saying we're generating this extra variable sig1 that is just a signal, a single bit. Um, we also have a vari variable we're going to use. Um, the advantage of variables is you can see they have these nicer types, like we have an integer here. So you can just assign, you know, 34 to it down here in the bottom. Um, and then you can do stuff like add and compare with the integer. Um, and it's all a lot more native, a lot easier to understand. So that's what a typical-ish VHDL file looks like. Again, this class isn't going to teach you everything about it. I'm trying to sort of introduce you a little bit to what it looks like, and maybe if you're interested or you need to in the future, you have some idea um, of where to start. So when we have those signals, um, you know, we have a signal declaration here, we can assign a value to it in a bunch of different ways. So for example, a three input NAND gate. If we have ABC and output signal F, um, we assign it with this uh, angle bracket equals line. And so we would have something like this. So we have an entity, again, we're saying ABC F. So three inputs. One output. Um, and then you have the architecture, so the architecture is equal, F, and you assign it to not 
and we use parentheses then to split off not everything inside that, A, M, B, and C. So that's just the three input not gain. Um, you can conditionally assign it. So for example, assign it to something when some condition is true or something else when not. So here we have the example, implement this logic function in VHDL using um, that, using the when condition type thing. So what we're doing here is we're actually seeing, okay, well, we have, let's see, L, M, N, three input variables, and we're actually generating a truth table here. Um, and if you generate the truth table, you can see basically that when L is zero, M is zero, and N is one, the output's one, so there's only a few cases that it's one. L is one, M is one, so in this first one, L is zero, L is one, M is one. It's also one, in this case we don't care about N, so in both the zero and one case. And in all other situations, it's zero, L zero. Um, so this sort of assignment is again con occurring um, continually. So as soon as one of these variables changes, instantly the output is updated, that F3 value. Um, we can also use a case statement, um, which similar to the last one, we're using it to, based on some inputs, decide what to do. It tends to be a little um, cleaner. So we're saying if we want to have a mux, a 4 to 1 mux again, and now what we're going to do, these are just single bits. And mx out. Um, and then we have the select line. In this case, the select line is actually, you'll notice what they called it, the standard logic vector which is again a bus. Um, so it's two bits, but the two bits are written in a way that you just have to reference it um, as a single variable. So in this example, it says with SEL select. So when SEL is one one, the output's D3. When it's one zero, it's D2. When it's zero one, it's D1. When it's zero zero, it's D0. And uh, in any other case, it's just set to zero. Um, it may seem crazy because there's two bits, there is no other cases, but why they put this is just um, mostly for simulation reasons because if these were, you know, high impedance state or some invalid state, it's telling the simulator that put it to zero. Um, you don't really need to worry about that right now though. As I mentioned, we have an idea of processes. Inside a process, everything occurs sequentially. Um, in VHDL, processes look like this. So we have a process. Um, in here, between begin and end process, these are where the statements are executed one after each other. Um, here, you can d define if you want to use variables or signals inside that process. So, you know, maybe you, you want something like you want, you know, a is equal to some input plus C, and then you'll have an if A is greater than you know, 3, then you do something. Um, so you might have something that looks like that. And you would declare the variable A here, and then write the statements here. Um, and we also have what's called a sensitivity list. And this list is a list of all Whenever a variable in that list changes, this process is run. Um, so for example, in this case, uh, what was this, input plus C. If you had, you could put input in here, input in C. So whenever the value of input changes, it's gonna do this. Whenever the value of C changes, it's gonna do this in sequence. Um, so when we use the processes, uh, the most basic example is one where there's just a single line in it. Um, so here's an XOR, for example. So I have a process A and B. Whenever A and B changes, so if A was 1 and it becomes 0, run this. Then F is equal to AX or B. Um, so this is really just what looks like a different way of writing the same stuff we've been using. Um, the difference 
here is we're using what we call a behavioral um, design of it. So when we use a process, we can say, I want you to you know, set A to 34 and then add 3 and then compare it. What you're really describing is how you want the whole unit to behave. If you're not necessarily saying, do it in this exact order. It'll look at that. It'll say, OK, the behavior is he's comparing A to whatever. Um, He's comparing A to whatever, and then do acting upon it. So you're telling the, uh, the system how it should behave, and it'll figure out the logic required to behave that way. Um, so you're working at a higher level. And the stuff we're doing, we've designed, you know, we figured out the behavior, then designed gates to implement it. Here, you can describe the behavior, and then you're done. Um, so there's a longer example where we have, again, a variable A and B, which are integers. So we assign A and B some numbers. Um, we assign A1 something, which is a signal defined there. And then we do some comparison. And based on that comparison, define the output. Um, so that's sort of another example of a process. I had used through these if statements. Um, this is the general form of them, if there's some condition. Then we do these statements, else if, do this. Otherwise, do that. Um, as I mentioned, there's a slide before saying basically you always need the end if to define it. So these are just an easy way to act differently depending on the input variable. So you often use those in processes because you'll say if something, do this, then do that, or do that. So to give you an idea, here's a D flip-flop um, implemented in VHDL. So you can see we have a box. We have a port D. We have a clock port. And we have a Q output. Um, so that's what this first entity is telling us, because those are the ports. Now we have what actually happens in the, the design. So we have a process. And the process, as you can see, is only dependent on the clock. Um, so whenever the clock changes, it'll run, not whenever the D input changes. Um, so only when the clock input changes. And we use this construct here, this macro, that says if rising edge. And this is just used to only work on the rising edge of the clock. So that'll evaluate to true if the clock gets the rising edge of the clock. Um, you can do the same thing with the falling edge. So if it is the rising edge of the clock, then Q becomes D. Um, so this is sending forward the value of D to Q. If this statement, you'll notice there's just this. If that, do that. Um, otherwise, it does not update the value of Q. So that's sort of implied by the fact that there's no other um, option. So what sort of I wanted to show you is that we can use VHDL to create state machines. Your handout has the copies of what I'm going to show you um, here, just for reference. So we had a merely state machine described. This is that simple on-off switch. Um, and I think, yeah, this is program. So we had, if the on-off switch, you see there's the four LEDs that are on. And if you go off, they should turn off. And the bottom one will go on to indicate a beep. So it doesn't do anything if it's off. If it's on, it turns on and beeps off. Beeps, turns off. Um, so with a mealy state machine, we just had two states. And the output depends on the state and inputs. So there's three parts to the, um, the VHDL code. The first part is the where we basically where's the first part? Yeah, um, the first part is we're going to define a few intermediate variables. So you notice we have this this state variable, um, which we actually give it some nice symbolic names. So we call it state on or state off. That's it. We're going to define some things like. If the switch is off, the push button for the switch off, push button for the switch on, 
um, the lamp output and the buzzer output. So what you can see is I've used these switch off and switch on um, to be assigned from the actual physical switch name. So now when we're working with the code, we have some nice names, switch on and switch off. And the likewise, I've assigned the lamp, the state of the lamp, to four LEDs, and I've assigned the buzzer um, to a single output LED. So using this, these signals, you can see that it makes the code a lot easier to read because we just have this nice, uh, these nice names that are much easier to understand than remembering oh, was switch four, what was switch four again? Um, so the logic to do the state transition, um, we just add if we're if the clock changes or the reset changes, run this process. So if reset is one, we go to the off state. Otherwise, every time there's a rising edge of the clock, run the following stuff. So only on the rising edge, um, on the following edge, don't do anything. And all it's doing is it's checking there's a case statement. So what's the current value of state? Is it S off or is it S on? If it's S off, um, it just checks the value of the on push button. If the on push button is one, it updates the state to now be on. Otherwise, it updates this, uh, otherwise it does nothing basically. It stays in the off state. If the off push button's one and we're in the on state, then we likewise flip to the other state. So all this is doing basically is the, um, is this part here. It's just doing the transitions. It's not dealing with the outputs. So those four parts of the if else statement are doing those four um, transitions. This is the mealy state machine. So the outputs are determined on based on the current inputs in addition to the state variable. We do this asynchronously, which means you'll notice there's no clock. So every time any of those changes. So if the state changes, the on push button changes, or the off push button changes, we have to run this group. Um, so for example, if we're in the on state, if we're already in the on state, and the just the off push button changes, then we run this. And what we do is we go through, we go, okay, when S on, lamp, uh, the lamp output goes to one, so we're turning the light on um, because we're in the on state. That part doesn't matter in the inputs. We also sample the input state, and this is where we update the buzzer. So if we're going to be changing state because we're currently in the on state and the off push button comes on, we set the buzzer to one. Otherwise, the buzzer goes to zero. Um, and we do the same thing with the S off. So this, all this logic here is doing just the output, uh, gain for the mealy state machine. For the more state machine, we just have four states instead of two, um, but the output logic is slightly simpler. So this part's the same. You notice we have two extra states, the beep on and beep off. Um, and now the state machine, you'll notice, has there's S off and S on, but there's also this beep on and beep off state. Um, and the beep on and beep off are just intermediate states that always transition to the next state. The output logic, because it's a more, is a game based solely on the current state alone. Um, so you can see when we're in a certain state, we just use, based on that, assign the output variables. Um, so we assign, you know, in the on state, lamp is one, we don't buzz. In the beep on, um, we buzz. And then same with the beep off, we buzz. So that's a super quick introduction to um, VHDL and how you can use it for state machines. So what it's showing you is that it's way easier because you don't have to go through the whole design process of you know create K maps for every possible variable. Um, it's also very easy because you know you can have you don't really care if there's 16 input variables. That's fine. There's more code to write, but you're not creating these crazy you know this crazy amount of logic. Um, if you're interested in learning VHDL, as I said, this isn't something that will be tested, um, or I don't think we'll have a lab with it. Um, but there's a lot of examples online. There will be a version of the firmware for this board or a version of that project file that uses VHDL. 
um, with some examples that I don't think is up yet. There's a bunch of examples. This website, as I said, there's a totally free book um, that's pretty short, a few hundred pages, so it's just introductory. There's tons of books. There's at least 10 books in the library dealing with VHDL. This book you can get with your DAO login online um, and is pretty good. And that's it. So thanks for coming. That's the quick introduction.